Prior to Mule Runtime 4.2.0, the only ways to achieve parallel processing were batch job, wrapping a sync scope in for each, and scatter gather. Each of them served a different purpose but were based on two common principles parallelism and asynchronism. The problem with batch was the heavy lifting it used to do for reliability. Also, it was asynchronous which means you could not use its output in the next processor. Although you could use an aggregator to do the same but overall it was an overkill for simple transformations of huge payloads. Async scope is lightweight but as it's asynchronous we cannot accumulate the data right away unless we do some work around. Scattergather just scatters the same payload across multiple routes but does not split the payload. Thanks to parallel for each scope which was built just to serve the same purpose. Starting from Anypoint Studio 7.6 we have a drag and drop option available for parallel for each. In this video, we'll try to play around the parallel for each scope and also understand the role of max concurrency and its optimum value. I've added the video timestamps in the description below. You can use them to navigate throughout the different sections of this video. So let's get started with the demo. I have already dragged and dropped a parallel for each scope. You can search it in the Mule palette. Make sure that you have the latest version of Anypoint Studio. As of now, it's 7.6. So I've already configured this parallel for each. So let's see at the configuration. Uh, in the collection, I am initializing it with an array uh, which starts from 1 and ends uh, to on 10. Then we can also optionally specify a timeout that how long that the uh, root should run because in this case we'll have 10 routes because it's from 1 to 10 so there will be 10 uh, parallel routes so we can uh, specify timeout for the routes uh, max concurrency will come to this later on uh, as of now it's the amount of parallelism that we can have and by default mule if not specified mule optimizes it as uh, per the resources available uh, then target you can specify any target variable name and the value will be pushed to that uh, target for example here it's payload and we did not specify anything so it will be available in payload but if you give any name uh, any variable name uh, it will be available in that variable outside the for each scope so that's about the parallel for each scope and let's see what i've done in the flow so I've uh, added uh, a variable named accumulator which is initialized with an empty array. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to accumulate the values in this accumulator. Whatever happens in parallel for each, I'm trying to accumulate it uh, outside the parallel for each, uh, as the, just as the way we do in uh, the for each scope. Then I've added a logger to record the state of uh, accumulator so initially it will be blank so it will be printing the accumulator for each route then we have uh, we are printing the payload that is coming to parallel for it so that would be the numbers ranging from 1 to 10 then i am trying to add the value to the accumulator so the payload that is 1 to to 10 will be added to accumulator then I am also initializing a new local variable uh, named as local and then in the logger outside the parallel for each I am printing the payload and then I am uh, trying to print the accumulator to see if this accumulator got changed or it remains as it is and then I have uh, tried to print the variable local which was created in the parallel for each scope. And then finally I have a transform uh, getting the payload from uh, output of the parallel for each. So let's try to run this uh, program and see the output. So I've deployed the application and also triggered a request from the browser and over here we can see that we have uh, re received uh, the whole payload that went through the parallel for each so now let's analyze the logs what we have got and as we can see it's printing the blank array so this is done by the first logger and we can see over here we have vars.accumulator so it's 
basically printing uh, the accumulator so what we can understand from this is that none of the routes was were able to modify this accumulator that is why each of them any of the routes like we had 10 so all of the 10 have printed it as blank next we have is the logger which is printing the payload that is being passed by the parallel for each that is from 1 to 10 and let's see what sequence it is so we can see it's in randomized order it's six one three eight so it's it's not the order that which we are sending it's from one to ten so it should be ideally one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten but instead it's random so it depends upon which thread occupies the cpu first uh, on that basis uh, uh, the cpu time gets allocated and it's printing the logs and uh, next we have in the next logger we are printing the payload of the parallel for it, the output of parallel for it so let's check that so so it's a big payload and it has it's an array which has multiple fields like inbound attachment names exception payload inbound property so it, it looks similar to that of a list file processor which also outputs the same thing but uh, the main point of interest is the payload that we are having and if you observe we get payload 1 2 3 then 4 then 5 similarly so what we observe over here is that it's in sequence the sequence that we sent is being maintained in the final aggregated payload so we need not worry about the sequence although it processes it in a random order but at the end the output of uh, the parallel for each has the payload in the sequence form then let's move on to the next logger and we are trying to print the accumulator so let's see are we able to accumulate the values in the accumulator so it's it's a blank array which means that the values were not accumulated uh, in the accumulator uh, which happens in a normal for each scope where we can accumulate the values from inside the loop to an outside variable then we have null value so <clears throat> it's printed by the last logger which is printing vars.local so the local variable we had initialized inside the parallel for each which was taking in the payload so that is printed null which means that this particular local variable cannot be accessed outside the parallel for each scope and also it cannot be accessed across multiple routes of the parallel for each scope so here are the three takeaways from this demo one is uh, that the processing happens in a randomized order depending on which thread gets the cpu time first and uh, then the accumulated output always maintains the sequence in which the payload was sent to the parallel for its scope second is we cannot accumulate the data inside a parallel for each scope using an external variable that's not possible and the third takeaway is any variable initialized inside a parallel for each scope cannot be accessed outside the parallel for each scope and also it cannot be accessed through multiple routes of the parallel for each scope so each route is isolated from other route and one more problem can be that since the payload is huge uh, it, it has multiple properties so if uh, the payload is very huge it it, it can be a it can cause uh, some problems so that's another thing to keep note of and finally in the transform we are just getting the payload from the payload because the structure is like this we have the payload and then we have again a field call as payload so we retrieved all the payload and then sent the response back so this is the response with the sequence intact now let's try to understand the behavior of parallel for each under error scenarios so to simulate the same i have intentionally made some failures the idea is that if it if the number is even that is payload mod 2 becomes 0 then we pass the payload as it is otherwise we fail with an error message as odd number and the parallel for each still runs from 1 to 10 
and then I have added a logger to output the payload to see if it really moves forward or it just stops at the parallel for each scope after completion so let's check that out so I've deployed the application and triggered a request from the browser and I can see uh, we are getting errors so let's just go back to the log and check I've added a logger also after the transform to see which records have been processed so we can see all the even numbers 6 2 8 4 10 were processed and the odd numbers are not being logged because they threw exception so it's basically complaining about the route 0 because route 0 had 1 right and indexes start from the position 0 so uh, the one element was odd then we have the route 2 which had the element uh, uh, which was odd and similarly uh, it's showing the field records so the final logger which is present over here which is supposed to print the payload didn't work because uh, the exception occurred and it usually throws a composite route error and doesn't uh, propagate uh, further so if unhandled it will stop after the execution of all the routes so it it didn't uh, stop uh, on failure of one route but it wait uh, it was waiting for all the other routes to complete and then it ended by throwing a composite route exception uh, it's the same way as a scatter gather works right even in scatter gather uh, if any one route fails it doesn't fail the other route but completes them and then at the end uh, it throws a composite routing error and the same is done by parallel for each now uh, in the next uh, uh, flow what i've done is i've added a try catch block on top of the parallel for each and even this has the same thing uh, sorting out the even and odd numbers and in case of odd uh, it fails and I've added an on error continue so that at least we see what is the payload that is being returned by the parallel for each and uh, in the error on error continue I'm just uh, logging the error type uh, what is the error type being written so let's just try to run this and check what the log it's printing I have just triggered the request on error handled resource and let's check the logs what we have got over here so we see uh, it, it's printing the same error logs that uh, used to occur earlier and then there are a few other logs one is the the error type that we printed so it's mule uh, composite routing and then i've added one more logger inside this to print the payload if we have any so there's there's no payload as such coming in the error so the payload is lost completely uh, and uh, then uh, in the last logger message processor again the payload is blank which means that if we handle uh, the error using uh, by surrounding the parallel for each with a try scope we lose the payload we we don't have uh, the payload that is the other three other five values which succeeded right we didn't even get the even values as well we just got a blank payload so it, it failed uh, completely even though it processed the even values it, it didn't return them so if you surround uh, a parallel for each with a try catch uh, it's not a good idea because you lose the values so in the other uh, flow what we have done is we have added a try catch inside a parallel for it so that uh, any route which fails is handled using an on error continue and we do not uh, uh, hurt the whole process we just handle the one thing and it should give us the response so let's just uh, try to hit uh, this another flow let me get the resource from here and trigger so yeah so it has processed let's see the log once 
So what do we observe that despite the errors, we have got errors on multiple routes, but what we observe over here is that we are getting the response back, right? Even the odd values are available in the response. So in this way, we can uh, handle uh, the errors using on error continue. Now it is having the same response, right? We can optionally add a transform and because it, it didn't change the payload, the payload is as it is because for five it had failed, but it was caught and uh, then uh, it ideally should have uh, means we should have added some another value to the payload. But since we didn't do anything, it continued with the same payload that it had uh, received. So we can add a transform over here and uh, try to change the value of uh, this particular payload wherever the error occurs. I have made slight modifications to the flow. I have instead added a transform and the transform just replaces the payload with odd because previously we were getting the same payload as is right in the error on error continue. So I have added uh, odd string to it. So it should have the value as odd. So let's go to the logs and uh, just check it once. So we have a logger in the on error continue. So that particular logger is printing the error type, which is mural expression because it failed in transform. And previously it was printing a composite error because it was outside the uh, the try was outside the for each. So the for each was throwing the composite error, but now it's wrapped, uh, it's wrapping the transform. So we are getting mule expression error. So for each uh, failed records, we are getting the same mule expression error. Now let's come back to the main point that we have changed uh, uh, the error handling for odd numbers. So if we observe uh, the first element is odd, second uh, is having the same value two third is odd. So it's basically replacing all the values uh, with the uh, odd string. So this is how we can handle errors inside uh, parallel uh, for each. Now let's try to understand the optimum value for max concurrency like we discussed earlier. So max concurrency means the amount of parallelism that we want to have, right? So the formula is if we have a CPU intensive task, like it's just transformation, we can use this formula, which says that number of threads, which effectively means the max concurrency because it depends on number of threads. So the number of threads should be less than or equal to the number of cores. So this is the standard formula. And if it happens to be blocking tasks, like you are writing to some file or maybe a database. So the formula changes to the number of threads should be less than or equal to the number of cores divided by one minus blocking factor, where the blocking factor should be greater than zero and less than one. So it should lie between zero and one, both the values excluded. What happens if you uh, make it as zero? So one minus zero would be one and it would be as good as number of threads equal to or less than the number of cores, which is for processing intensive tasks. So it should not be the case. And it should also not be equal to one because one minus uh, one would be zero and anything divided by zero is indeterminate or infinite, which means that your thread has encountered a deadlock. So these are the few points to keep in mind. So, but how did we derive to this formula? It's an important thing to understand. So let's understand that in the next slide. Suppose we have four gentlemen, A, B, C, and D, and they are in a food court to have their lunch and they only find two tables. So what happens? A goes and occupies the first table, B goes and occupies the first, uh, second table. And uh, while A is trying to have the first bite, he realizes that C and D are standing over there. And he feels guilty and says that, how can I have a bite when C and D are standing? So he hardly has one bite and comes out and allows C to uh, occupy the space and same happens with the B uh, then B comes out and D occupies the space and again D 
takes starts taking the bite and then he realizes that a and b are standing and it would be so rude of him to have bite when others are standing and waiting for them so what he does he moves out of the place and a occupies the space again and same happens with d and d also comes out and b occupies the space so this things continue again and a after having the second bite he realizes okay c and d are standing how can i occupy so he comes out c goes in so do you observe they are switching the places and none of them is being able to eat the food properly right they hardly have one bite and they just move out and the same thing happens with threads consider that a b c and d are threads and this two boxes which are the tables are the cpu cores so now if you specify four threads max concurrency has four whereas you have only two uh, cpu cores a b c and d will be fighting amongst each other for uh, not fighting they are all are gentlemen so they will be Uh, struggling for the resources so a comes out c goes in b comes out so there will be a huge amount of context switching which would make your program slower even slower than sequential processing in some cases so this is just not a good idea so that is why we say that the number of threads should always be less than or equal to the number of cores when it is a cpu intensive task so had then had there been only uh, max concurrency set to 2 so two can process and then other uh, remaining task or two threads can do the task easily right because they can occupy the thread and there would be no context switching so it should always be the number of threads uh, less than or equal to number of cores in case of cpu intensive task now what about the blocking task why the formula for blocking task is in this way so now let's assume that any thread does the job and is blocked for half of the time for example it it works for 60 seconds the whole process that the thread does is of 60 seconds and out of the 60 seconds it's blocked for 30 seconds which means that it has a blocking factor of 0.5 right so you can decide this blocking factor like uh, put a logger before the database insert and put outside after it and see the time difference that it's taking to insert the data so uh, and then uh, this time is what percent of the whole time and that will give you the blocking factor the ratio of time uh, the actual blocking uh, time for which it was waiting uh, upon the time the total time of transaction so that will be your blocking factor so the example that we took where it waits for 30 seconds Uh, which roughly calculates to half uh, which is 0.5 so 1 minus 0.5 becomes uh, 0.5 and if the number of cores are uh, 2 it becomes almost double right so the number number of threads could be uh, if the number of cores are 4 so it 4 into 2 it should be less than or equals to 8 but now you might be wondering it becomes more than the number of cores so won't there be context with switching Yes of course there will be a context switching but it's for the good of the threads let me explain you why for example a and b are uh, eating their food okay and what happens is a is uh, a had his food and b also had his food and uh, he orders uh, buttermilk and b also orders buttermilk but uh, buttermilk takes like 10 minutes to Uh, come on the table right to be served so for 10 minutes a is idle and so is b so in this 10 minutes can be utilized by c and d rather than just idling around the cpu time c and d can occupy the thread uh, uh, cpu right so that is why we can have an increased number of threads over here because it's waiting whenever it's waiting it will be bumped out of the uh, cpu and the another one who is waiting he'll get a chance to work on it but if you do not uh, do that if you just keep it as two so what will happen a will unnecessarily sit and consume the time of uh, uh, the cpu right so so the number of threads over here can be greater that in in a way that if 
A is uh, not doing any work. It's just waiting for something like for 10 minutes. So C can utilize that 10 minutes and do the task. So that's the logic behind having the uh, number of threads for blocking and the number of threads for CPU intensive. So always remember if it's CPU intensive, make sure that it should be always less than or equal to the number of cores. So in, in our case, it's the maximum concurrency. So you need to know the uh, number of available cores that is uh, the processor. You can also get it using the uh, Java's runtime class uh, runtime dot uh, get runtime dot uh, get available processor. So that will give you the number of cores and the same uh, same thing applies for uh, the blocking one. So this is how you will decide the number of maximum concurrency. So if it's four cores, your maximum concurrency in case if there are only CPU intensive tasks in your parallel for each, it should be four. And in case if it's, uh, if there is some database write operation or read operation or file write operation in your parallel for each, then you should uh, find out the blocking factor and just put the value, substitute the value and get the number of uh, threads which would equate to the max concurrency and that would be the optimal value. Now here's a graph that shows the performance with respect to the number of threads. So I've considered the number of cores to be 4 and if you observe that uh, the graph is rising linearly with the number of if the number of uh, core uh, threads is 1 and the performance is 100 so and now the number of threads increase to 2 it becomes 200 increase to 3 it becomes 300 it it attains a peak at when the number of threads equal to the number of cores it attains a peak of 400 but and considering that the whole process is uh, cpu intensive so we have made that assumption and uh, so, so it's at its optimum level at where the number of threads are equaling the number of cores the moment it exceeds we can see there is a performance loss uh, when the number of cores are less and the number of threads are more than the number of cores so in in some cases in worst case scenario it the performance could be even bad than a sequential processing so make sure that if it is cpu intensive it should always be less than or equal to the number of cores and if it is blocking uh, it should be the number of cores divided by 1 minus the blocking factor. Now let's try to apply what we just learned about max concurrency. So in this case I have uh, kept the max concurrency to 4 because I know that I have logical processor as 4 although the cores are 2 uh, the logical processors are 4 that's due to hyper threading so the logical processors are 4 and I can I can also verify using uh, a Java runtime so let's just uh, try to run this uh, let's quickly run as Java application and see the number of cores that we have So it has printed four, which means we have total of four cores available. Now let's move back to our application. It's running. Okay. So what I have done is I have set uh, the maximum concurrency to four. And what I'm doing is I'm just simulating a payload, which will have, uh, which will be uh, transformed into an array. And that array has thousand element with the same uh, object and to uh, calculate the time i have uh, initialized a variable t1 and i am populating it value now whatever the timestamp would be at that point of time and then in the uh, parallel for each we don't need a try it's just uh, there for uh, because i initially i had done some failure mechanism in it so we don't need that but let it be uh, so now here I am just transforming the payload. Uh, it's just uh, just changing the name from first name to first underscore name last name. Just trivial transformation so that it it becomes a bit uh, uh, CPU intensive. Uh, 
and then uh, in the logger i am uh, logging the time difference that is now minus vars dot t1 and just a log to print uh, uh, the payload in the end and then a transform to send back the message so let's quickly try to run this uh, let me see the resource path it's parallel so let's run it and see what time it takes okay so it has printed so I just see uh, 10 records whereas it should have been 1000 because we are printing unto 1000 right so the problem over here is that I have included this 1 to 10 but instead it should be payload so we'll uh, just add payload and just try to run it once again let's wait for it to get redeployed so I have deployed and uh, re-triggered the request and I do see now there are like around 1000 requests coming uh, it's truncated but that's fine uh, so what do we observe we can uh, see the time uh, stamp over here right what's the time so what I'll do is I'll just uh, remove this uh, logger and we'll fire uh, like around 10 requests and see what is the average time that we receive so let's just remove the payload logger and redeploy the application once again and we'll fire 10 requests so I've uh, redeployed the application and uh, triggered around uh, 10 requests and we do see that on an average it's around uh, 300 uh, milliseconds 0.3 seconds uh, so let me just uh, hit it again and see. so it sometimes takes uh, 0.3 seconds to 4 seconds and uh, sometimes it it goes about one second so so, so let's uh, assume the 10 readings for the time being and let's just copy the whole thing and uh, then what we'll do is we'll try out with the increased number of threads to see how it works so we have this readings for max concurrency s4 is 4 now what I'll do is I'll just randomly increase the size I'll make it as like maybe four thousands and just save it so that it gets redeployed so I've uh, redeployed the application with uh, max concurrency with an insane amount of 40,000 and I've triggered 11 requests and what do we observe is that it takes 0.7 seconds then 0.37 which can consider it as 0.4 then we have 0 0.56, 0 0.63 once in a while we got 0.33 that's fine but it's anytime it's about 4.4 uh, right so it, it will be uh, anywhere between around 0.55 seconds whereas in the previous case we had uh, uh, the values around 0.2 so what we'll do we'll calculate the average of both of them and see which or which one of them comes uh, higher so now I have segregated the values for max concurrency when it was 4 and when the max concurrency was insanely high as 40,000 so what we'll do we'll calculate the average we have 11 values in uh, both the cases and obviously uh, if we see if we just glance through the value we see that the max concurrency 4 took less time but just for accurate result let's do a fair amount of calculation so let's paste this and okay it's 3.97 let's divide it by 11 and we get it as 3.361 okay so average is average turns out to be 0.361 seconds
fair enough now let's go when the max concurrency was increased and let's calculate it's already 5.473 which is high and let's divide by 11 we get 0.498 we can assume round off 0.498 which is roughly close to 0.5 seconds so do we observe that it's it's a hardly 0.36 seconds and it goes to around 0.5 seconds so increasing the concurrency doesn't mean that you will have a good performance even if you make it as 1000 that makes no sense because you have only four number of cores so maximum parallelism that you can have will not be more than four because the hyper threaded cores that you have is only four in the case and when you increase the concurrency it can also give you a disastrous performance when uh, uh, when the CPU processing is very intensive here we didn't have much uh, intensive processing it was hardly a small transformation but when you uh, uh, use a reduce map uh, map object uh, all sorts of things that would be a very taxing task on the CPU and uh, they would be fighting for uh, CPU context switching would increase in such cases so so always remember that if you have cpu intensive task make sure that the number of cores should be equal to or greater than the number of threads which means the thread should be less than or equals to the number of cores and for blocking threads uh, blocking task you already know it should be number of cores divided by one minus uh, the blocking factor so it's not mandatory that you set this uh, max concurrency if you do not set this mule automatically takes care of it yeah, like see if it, it's mentioning that by default all routes are uh, uh, all routes will run in parallel assuming available resources so mule has the inherent capability to fine-tune it and you almost don't need to set this max concurrency for CPU intensive task it will do automatically but in case if you want to fine tune for some blocking task you you should take the control of uh, concurrency because you know how much uh, the task can be blocking by uh, doing out multiple trials and errors you you might uh, come to a particular value so so that is how you should uh, uh, fix the max concurrency to get a better performance and if you uh, uh, otherwise you can leave it blank mule will automatically handle it so that is the role that uh, maximum concurrency plays when improving the performance and you should definitely uh, try to uh, derive a better value at which your program runs very efficiently. So that, that is all about uh, the parallel for each uh, scope in Mule and I hope you might have found the video useful. Thanks for watching.